Uh, welcome everybody to a, another wonderful, fantastic, unbelievably exciting leadership factory. I am really excited. We've been doing these leadership factories now for about uh, eight, nine months. And today, I believe we have the most important one up to date. And when you see the guest that Oren Woodward brought on and you see the subject line and you see the how, how the impact it will have on the world, I believe you'll all agree. Now with that, for those of you that are joining us that are new to the Leadership Factory, this is a project that came about uh, due to my friend Doug Fireball and Paul Saunders, the founders of the Home Business Radio Network. I went to Oren and uh, you know Oren, what he does is he's a leadership guru. As a matter of fact, he's in the top 100, top 25, actually in the top 10, and pretty soon uh, up close to one and two, I think, Oren, in the world as a leadership factory guru. His blogs are unbelievable. The knowledge, the impact, the information that's shared, top 100 rated in the world in H&R management and business. He holds four patents. Uh, yeah, I believe he's one of the best communicators in the direct selling profession, actually in the world today, and he continues to grow and grow and more. And so with all that being said, um, I want to turn it over to my friend and my the, the host, the anchor of the Leadership Factory, Mr. Oren Woodward. Thank you, Tony. You know, I'm really excited for today. Uh, I asked Oliver DeMille to, to come on the show and just a little background. Oliver wrote uh, a couple top-selling books, uh, but my favorite is Thomas Jefferson Education. In fact, before I knew Oliver, I knew his books. I read, I, a good friend of mine had told me, you've got to read this book, and so he handed it to me, and I flipped through it, and I said, yeah, I might read it. And on the plane ride home, I happened to just open. I said, well, I'll just read the intro, and I read the intro, and that led me to the first chapter. And, you know, a couple hours later, I'm finished with the book, and I'm like, who is this Oliver DeMille? Like, where does this guy come from, and who, who thinks like this? And it, <laughs> it, just the whole concept of you've got to be passionate about education and, and not a leadership, not a factory-type model, but a leadership model, in fact, a leadership factory model, uh, it, and I just loved it. In fact, I said, I got to get to know this guy. And uh, Oliver was going through some massive he health challenges at the time. And so when I first reached out, I thought, well, maybe he just doesn't want to get to know anybody, you know. And then I found out, boy, he was really seriously uh, going through some health challenges. But uh, thankfully, um, he is healing up and his brain just works. He, he reads thousands of books. And I know he reads them because when we talk, I ask him a question on this and he refers back to it. So he's one of the most knowledgeable, hungriest students that I've ever met. And uh, and so when getting a chance to write um, our book here, Leadership Together, is uh, just That's been awesome. a total joy. And uh, when I heard that uh, it made the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller list, all this other good stuff, I'm like, well, fantastic. And this book would not have come together were it not for Oliver. He took some boring concepts. I always say that if I would have just wrote up a proposal on government that I had, I, I think I would have had 10 people really enjoy it and everybody else say, huh, what the heck, What? what is that? But so Oliver took these concepts and he weaved it into a story that is uh, a fable. And I don't want to share anymore because I want to turn it over to Oliver so he can kind of share for us. But Oliver, first of all, welcome to the Leadership Factory. Thank you. And uh, my first question for you is, um, <clears throat> When you heard about this uh, government proposal, I'm sure you've heard thousands of ideas on, well, so what made this one unique and then um, w what made you want to tackle this project and write leadership? Great questions. Well, as you know, I've been teaching and writing about freedom for almost 20 years now. And during that time, I've had no shortage of people coming forward with proposals of, here's how we fix America, here's how we solve the, the, the the challenges that are out there. Government's broken. Washington's not going to fix anything. Here, here's what we need to do. And of course, I agree with a lot of that, but I, over the years, I got a number of proposals from a lot of different people with a lot of different backgrounds and different perspectives. The proposals always pretty much fell into one of two camps. Um, either they were proposals that said, we need to go right back to the founders. We need to do exactly what the founders did. We need to repeal the 17th Amendment and change this and change that. And a lot of good ideas, but as you know, Americans, as, in, as a general rule, as a rule of thumb, Americans are futurists. We want to we move forward. We want to consider what we do right now better than what came in the past. So any proposal that really smacks of, we've got to go back, we've got to go back, we've got to go back, is not going to fly with the American people. It's not realistic. 
because Americans as a, as a people, we want to progress, we want to progress, we want to move forward, we want to be better than the past. So even though those, uh, those proposals had a lot of good ideas, they were just never, it was never anything that I felt like, wow, this will really sell. There would always be a few people maybe on the right or maybe on the left who would like it, but it wasn't going to sell to the, you know, to the American populace. The other type of proposal that came was something along the lines of, let's scrap everything that the founders did and let's just come up with this brand new thing that just you know, scraps, scraps the whole constitution and gets rid of the whole idea. And here's this new thing, there's new technology, let's just go to online democracy or you know, a number of different proposals. And again, I never felt that those were things that would really sell with the American people and I'm not sure they should sell because the, the American founding principles mean something. They really did create the best freedom model in history. Not perfect by any stretch, but certainly better than any other system we know of in history. And so I always wish there was a way to combine those, something futuristic, something that would move into the future and be a real, you know, not let's go back, let's go back, let's go back, but something that really built into this American ideal of we're going to improve on things, we're going to innovate, we're going we're to take what we have and make it better, and at the same time build on those founding principles. And then, come, and then along comes Orrin Woodward. Um, out of a business background, uh, <clears throat> leadership background, and um, when he told me that he wanted to meet, I was excited to meet. We, we had met before, but he wanted to meet on a specific proposal he said he had. So I wasn't sure what it was. I didn't know whether it was business oriented. I didn't know, I, I didn't know what the proposal was, but I was excited. I got there to the meeting with him. We were talking, and he said, hey, uh, I want to I want to show you this proposal I have for basically fixing America. And, you know, I put a, I smiled, and in the back of my mind I'm going, okay, is this going to be one of these one of these scrap everything proposals, or is it going to be a go back proposal? Because, again, over the years, just from so many different perspectives, that's what I'd always heard. Hmm. And Orrin pulls out this proposal, and it's this long list, and, and he had it printed out, and we start going through the points. And I, I just got more excited and more excited and more excited as we went because what Oren did is he, he instead of trying to copy the founders he emulated them he he took their principles he took the concepts that they built the, the whole freedom modern freedom system on and he and he structured those based on the principles not on the exact you know not on a go back to what they did but on a <clears throat> let's innovate let's initiate something better Let's adapt to our modern perspective. Let's take the founding principles and let's adapt them. Let's apply them. Let's implement them in an innovative way. Mm. And as I as we went through it, and it took us most of a day. We talked about all the different proposals from a bunch of different angles. I mean, it was a fun discussion. We, you know, we talked in the hotel room. We talked in the hotel lobby. We went to lunch. We drove around. <laughs> um, we had a lot of fun with it. And it was, you know, I mean, it was it's a great memory. But as the day went on, we got more and more excited, or at least I did, or and seemed to, we got more and more excited about the potential of this really making a difference. And it started out with 30-something, 30, 30 uh, maybe 32, 30, I can't remember exactly, but 30-something proposals that he had put together. And all of them were this unique blend of innovating but using the founding principles to do so. And I was really moved by it. And then we both decided, hey, I said, this is powerful. This is unique. This is different. This is something that can really make it. This is something that can really work. Because it's built on American founding thinking. It, it incorporates the principles and the ideals of freedom that really work and that are proven. But it does so in a catchy, innovative, different way that the American people can get excited about and not feel like we're just you know, going back to something that's, that's unproven. And as I got more excited about it, I started adding, you know, we started brainstorming, well, maybe we need this, maybe we need, I think we ended up with 40-something um, by the time we, you know, by the time I said, well, what about this and what about that? Not just that day, but in the days that followed, we, we kept talking, we kept discussing, and we ended up with a number, and then we started breaking them down to, okay, but which ones are realistic? 40 is too many to promote. And we ended up with, with the book Leadership. We talked about a bunch of different... Um, we talked about a bunch of different ideas. Should should this be should this be a political science book? Should this be a you know a business book like a Seven Habits kind of a book or something? Should this be? And we finally ended up saying, who are we really trying to reach? We're trying to reach business leaders. We're trying to we're trying to reach people in business communities 
entrepreneurs and executives, people who have so much leadership in them and they have the experience and they have the wisdom and they have the understanding, they know how to lead, but their leadership is ba basically latent in terms of politics because they put all of their they put all of their leadership into business, into their careers, into their companies, which makes sense. That's that's what they're doing. Um, but we're, we said, what if what if what if Washington's not going to fix this? Because I I think we're I think anyone who looks at it closely is pretty much convinced they're not. They've had decades to do so. It doesn't matter which party we elect; neither one's going to fix it. And and that's not to take away from some really good public servants who are there trying to do great things. Good for them. But the system itself is not going to be fixed from within, from Washington. It, something else go, is going to happen. And where is it going to come from? And as we looked around at the country, we said, it's business. Business leadership. There may be other places. There's certainly a lot of potential in the youth. There's a lot of potential potential in you know, in a number of sectors. Parents who really care and are trying to make a difference. But business needs to lead it. And so we said, we need to write a business fable, something that will speak to their language and their genre, something they'll actually read, something they'll get excited about and want to read. We need to keep it short enough that you know any business leader will will get intrigued on the uh, you know on the plane, like Warren said earlier, and read the whole thing. And and then you know I went home, he went home, we made, we went home with an outline and some ideas, and we spent the next six weeks or so just pounding through the chapters. Where I was so excited, I got home immediately and just started writing. Uh, it, that's what I remember, Oliver, is like, it seemed like I just got home and maybe one night passed and you sent me the first four or five chapters and I was yeah. already blown away. Like when I read that, I'm like, man, this is like inspired work and it, it's just like you took those concepts and boom, you were off and running. Well, I was so moved by the potential of this to really make a difference. And as we wrote the book, I mean, I would write a few chapters, I would send them to Oren, I would give them to my wife, Oren would give them to his wife. And then, you know, and then I would try to take a day off or something, but our wives would say, hey, wait, where's the next chapter? So we, we, <laughs> we, we couldn't get a break. Oh, no. Between Rachel and Lori, they're like, wait, wait, where's the next chapter? What happens with these people? So we just kept doing it. I would write a chapter. I would send it to Oren. He looked it over. He would call me back and say something like, man, I love it. Don't change a thing. And then he would give me like 40 changes to it, which were really cool. And it was really great. And, and his changes just totally took it. And then, and then it took it from one level to a higher level. And then I would say, well, wait a minute. What about this? It was one of those experiences, the whole writing of it. There's times in business, there's times in life where you just, you're working with somebody and there's just this flow, this synergy that mm -hmm. just kicks in. And you accomplish so much more w working with the person than you could have yourself. And you find I found myself so many times, I would I would send you know uh, I would I would take Oren's proposals and then the things that we had brainstormed together, and I would take his things and I would write them into the story, and then I would send it to him and he'd come back and have these ideas that just made it so much better. And then I would find myself having ideas that I thought made it even even better and then he would respond to my and it was just that and he would make it better it, it was it was a really it was it was one of those powerful synergistic moments of just writing this going deep having fun with it and I think both of us really got I know I did got really intrigued with the story and I just couldn't wait to see where it was going I would I would wake up at night and literally stay up all night writing because I just couldn't sleep I wanted to see what would happen to the characters that is awesome. You know, uh, first of all, Oliver, I want to I want to congratulate you on you know obviously getting up to the New York Times bestseller. I mean, as you know, Oren's no stranger to that. You know, like with uh, Thirteen right. Re Resolved and the leadership uh, launching a leadership revolution. I mean, he's certainly has uh, done very well here recent recently with uh, getting books up in the in the New York Times bestseller. But to do it so quickly, to be in the top twenty in Amazon, and I mean, just overnight, literally, uh, there's obviously an interest. And what we're sharing today, and there should be an interest, but I have a very important question. And over the last several years, um, I, I get a little upset when I see this left-right wing debate going on. And people get so focused on conservative, or you know, or, or you know, the liberals, and it's it's they get they miss everything. They miss all the forest of the trees, in my opinion. And uh, when I looked at uh, leadership, my question is: is how do we? Uh, because it's obviously not left or right. It, the freedom, it, you know, the essence of freedom is right there in the DNA of it. How um, how do we get people to understand 
that it has nothing to do with left or nothing to do with right and how it's important so that people can really see the message that you and Oren are conveying to the world with this book. You know, that's a great question. I, I think that's one of the most unique and interesting things about this book is that it really is not... It, it's not held by the right or by the left. It really gives answers and solutions that are about freedom. I like the way Oren says it. He says, I'm, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm an American. And I think we need more people who are thinking, at, thinking about it from that perspective. This is a book for Americans. This is a book for leaders. This is a book to tell Americans it's time to finally stand up and lead. Politicians won't solve these problems. Washington doesn't have the solutions. Um, it's going to take regular Americans who take some of that talent and that skill and that experience they have as leaders in their businesses, in their, you know, in their other walks of life that aren't politics, to move into the leadership realm of society and have an impact and make a difference. In fact, that's what the leadership means. It's a shift from looking. See, right now what happens is anytime there's a big problem in our country, we naturally, the media does this, almost everyone does this, we naturally look to Washington and we say, all right, what, what are you going to do to solve it? Or if it's a more local problem, we look to our state legislature or our state governor. We say, okay, what are you going to do to solve it? And the answer is, as hard as many of people will try, they're not going to do much of anything to solve it. The reality is that it's, it's not either not going to be solved or it's going to take an entrepreneurial, innovative approach. And that's something that government is not good at. Innovation is not their thing. But business leaders and thought leaders and regular people who really think deeply and take the time to step out of their normal comfort zone, take a look at what's going on and step out to make a difference, that's how, real, that's how real challenges and real problems get solved. And when that happens, when that innovation comes from the, from the people, politicians eventually will figure it out and, and follow suit. But we really need the inno innovation to come from the only place that innovation really does come from, which is people with an entrepreneurial mindset. Now let me ask you, Oliver, just a question on this. In my understanding this right, that the Founding Fathers really wanted government to really overall protect us. That was the main role of the government. And that pretty much, you know, everything else kind of happened uh, outside of the government, you know, the separation of the government. It was, not only, it was not only the main role, it was really the only role. The, the role of government was to protect people's inalienable rights. And specifically, it was to protect our rights from two dangers. One danger was international, you know, international thugs, international invasion, international attacks. People on an international level, other nations, uh, other groups that would want to come in and take away our inalienable rights. Mm -hmm. And that's why the states and the locales banded together to support a federal government which was to support us from, from something that would be big, that would be national level. Right. The, loca the locales and the local governments and the state governments were designed to protect us from the other source of attack, which would be criminal activity, other people trying to you know, break in our homes or steal things or you know, what, whatever, whatever they would do. So local, you know, local crime was to be protected by local and state level government you know, or in other countries, provincial. And the national or federal level was to be um, something that came from outside that, other governments, attackers, you know, invasions. Right. And that's really all that government was invented. For. That's why it was invented. L let me back up from that. Actually, there are two types of governments invented in history. There's those that are invented by those who want to conquer and control people. And there's those that are invented by citizens to create a free government. So when I say they were that the American government was that second kind, it was the kind of government that was created by the people, established by the people on purpose, with the fundamental goal of protecting us, of protecting our rights, of protecting us from, again, on a federal level, international conflict or invasion, and on a local level, any kind of crime or attack or you know that kind of thing. The other kind of government, force-based government, whose purpose is to conquer and control and dominate people, does exist in history, and of course, it you know it it has a it has a long uh, tradition of doing much more than protecting us. But people should think about that when the government that was established, an American government or a Canadian or a English government that is that was founded to be a protection of rights, when it starts doing the things that forced conquer-based governments have done in history, that should be our first clue. Wait a minute, something's off here. 
our government that was established for freedom is now based on a focus on force. Clearly, it's going in the wrong direction. Now, Oliver, this ties in. This is a perfect spot, Tony, to bring up the five laws of decline. You know, yes. <clears throat> my background is manufacturing systems. I love systems. You know, when I look at anything, I don't look at the waves. Um, I look at the tide, what's going on underneath. Because you can see the waves might be blowing one way because of the wind, but wherever the tide's going is ultimately where the water's going. And, you know, and so this five laws of decline, you talked about the two different types of government. I believe America was formed as one type of government, but through the five laws of decline is kind of shifting over to war, uh, more of a forced government, and, and it's systematic. In other words, you know, the example I use is uh, imagine a, a pool that has different jets, and if all the jets are blowing uh, in one direction and you've got five jets set up and they're all running, you get a current going in that pool. And if the current's going uh, in a direction of decline, and that's kind of what's happening in America, we've got these five laws working against us all the time. So I know, I remember the first time we sat down and we started talking through the five laws of decline. So what is your take on the five laws of decline, and why is that so important to this book? Well, it really is the fundamental, it's the centerpiece of the book. It's the start of the The book's really broken into two parts. The first roughly half of the book is about the five laws of decline and how these five laws of decline which are unknown to most people eat, are eating away at our big institutions they're eating away at our business institutions they're eating away at our government they're eating away at our citizenship and our freedoms as a society they're eating and and they're doing it again quietly because people don't really understand the five laws don't know them and so we're not able to counteract them either on a political or a business or even on a family level unless we can identify what they are and understand what's happening with them. So the first half of the book, and that's why we feel that it's so important to get this book out to the American people. The more the better. So that these five laws of decline can become understood by everyone. By your leaders, by your parents, by your average citizen, by your unaverage citizen. Everyone needs to understand these five laws of decline because by understanding them they will it will make so much sense to them to turn on the news and see what's happening the news is confusing to people they see all these crises they see all these challenges then they see all these political leaders and talking heads uh, you know saying well here's the answer but then the answers never get implemented what's that about why why does it keep going that way a lot of people in our day just turn it off because it makes no sense to them it, if 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 these are the problems and these are the solutions, well then why don't we just apply the solution? Well, we don't. And there's a number of reasons for those. In fact, in fact, there's five reasons for those. It's the five laws of decline. And once a person understands those five laws, they're going to look at that and they're going to say, oh, I get what's going on. I get what I need to do. I get why this, is, why this is this way. The second half of the book is then once the people know the five laws of decline, here are some solutions. And we, we narrowed our list of Started out with just above 30 that Warren handed to me. Again, we brainstormed more and got up around, I don't know if we ever got as high as 50, maybe mid-40s, but we, we yeah, did a bunch of it. And then, we, and then we narrowed it down. Um, but we, we narrowed it down in this book to nine specific proposals that if applied, and again, these are built on the founding thinking of freedom, but they're new, they're fresh, they're unique, they're a new approach. It's not let's go back, it's let's go forward with these nine proposals that could really make a difference. Giving our current situation, our current constitution, where it stands right now, where our society and the laws stand, add these nine into the mix, and this is a real change. This is going to change the entire direction of our society if we can apply these nine, or even a few of it. And, you know, and, and Orrin and I have others beyond the nine, but these were the ones we said, let's start with these. If we can get some of these implemented into our society, these are real solutions that can really happen but they're not these nine solutions are not going to occur in any reality unless the people understand the five laws of decline because if they understand what's really happening then they're naturally going to move in this direction let, let me I, I we keep saying the five laws of decline yeah, let me I was gonna say Oliver Tony I mean give Tony and and everybody who's watching give them just a, a, a nutshell of what are these five laws and knowing with your 25, 30 years experience, I mean working with W. Cleon Skousen who I think is one of the best scholars of our Constitution out there, um, your perspective of explain the five laws decline and then uh, explain how the five laws decline have worked on the Constitution from your perspective. 
perfect. Um, without just listing them in order, let me just take one at a time, and we'll see how far we get. If we only get to one or two, that's fine. People can get the book and go, you know, more detail and study it. Sure, um, and, 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 all, and it also five, is, that's great too. In Oren's blog, he's done a really good job, as you know, yes. of covering that as well. So people that want to get an understanding of it, yes, I've yes. read him. It's unbelievable the information. I know you guys were collaborating on that, but in his blog is such a great and synopsis of the five laws of decline that someone could get it just like that. So it's a great way to get it right away. Let me give one example. One of the laws is Bostiet's laws, and I think Oren did such a fantastic job of pulling together these five laws from all these different places in history and all these different people who put them together. And when you see how these fit together, it's just amazing. It, I mean, he was taking it from a standpoint originally, I think, of here's here's what here's why businesses decline. Here's if your business isn't succeeding. Understand these five laws, and, and let's apply these five laws to your business, and then we'll know which one's breaking down, and then we know how to address it. We know how to fix it. When he started telling me in a, these five laws in a context of the, of the nation, it just clicked for me, and I saw immediately how the, the, it fit. And as I, any time I apply them to a current event or a current issue, it becomes immediately clear which law is the lead in this one. One law I'll, just, uh, I'll, I'll share is Bostiet's law. Bostiet's Law, in a nutshell, this comes from Frederick Bostiet, who wrote The Law, What is Seen and What is Not Seen, and a number of other essays uh, in, in, in the 19th century. One, one fantastic, uh, basically what he says, and this is just, it's a, fa it's a fantastic thing to understand, is that people would rather get things easily than get things the difficult way. Most people would rather take the easy road to, to any result than the hard road to that result. I mean, that's obvious, but when it's applied to government, it becomes a huge thing. How many people are on welfare? How many people are on some sort of government subsidy, some sort of government funding? How many people um, in society, and, and how many laws are passed at the national and local and state levels simply because there's people out there saying, I'd rather, I'd rather you know, have the easy way, and leaders who say, well, let's make it easy for people. That law is so profound and so powerful because it says that in any given society, once you start to use government resources to make things easy for people, that is naturally going to grow. And there's pretty much no way to stop it because to stop it, look what you have to do. You have to convince the people who are having the easy way to stop doing it the easy way and start doing it the hard way. And you have to convince other people, the voters, and you have to convince the voters who are allowing it to happen to do the hard thing to step up, get involved, and stop it. So even the ones who aren't receiving the easy way or the easy funds are still getting the benefit of it because it's easy for them to just sit back and let it happen. And, and not until their taxes start to skyrocket or until regulation starts to impinge on them and their business do they say, hey, wait a minute, how did we, how did we get this far along? And by that, that point, many in many cases, it's too late or it's a lot more difficult to stop it. So you create this thing, you know, Basiat's Law creates this scenario where you've got a whole nation and it grows and grows. And I think now it's around 47 to 51 percent, depending on which statistic you're looking at, people who are in some sort of government handout. When you reach and when you reach that point, you're at a point where the easy thing is for those people to keep getting it, and you've got to convince them to drop it and do the hard thing. That's a hard that's a hard sell, and they're almost half the population, so there you have a huge voting block. And secondly, if you want to stop it, you've got to convince the other people who aren't receiving the benefit to do the hard thing, step out, get involved, uh, you know, make their influence felt, maybe maybe run for office or get some get you know really involved with those who are in office that's hard they'd rather do it the easy way so they just focus on their career and say well it's it, it, it's all going to heck in a handbasket I guess I, I guess I'll just focus on my thing because that's the easy way the politicians in order to do something about it have also got this is a third thing they've got to take the hard road they've got to go back to their constituency stand up in front of them argue with them tell them they don't want these benefits and that they do need to stand up and make their influence felt most most voting electorates that's not what they vote for. They're like, oh, nah, just okay. We'll vote for you, or we won't vote for you. I mean, look what look what happened to Mitt Romney when he said the forty-seven percent who were going to vote for, you know, without getting political one way or the other, 
if a, if a Democratic president would have said the same thing or a Democratic candidate, they would get a similar return from, from the populace who says, wait a minute, you, you can't take away our benefits. Why are you attacking us? Th those, are, those, are, those are legitimate government benefits. So Bostiet's Law is this huge thing that eats away at our society. I mean, you could apply it to business, too. How many people within a business are productive versus those who are unproductive who are, are finding the easy way out today on the job or the easy way out this week on the job? You know, and, and leaders find ways to have a scoreboard of who, who, are the, who are our employees who are taking the easy road and who are the ones that are doing the hard work that are, re that, that are really creating produ productivity, it's hard for nations to have that same kind of a scoreboard, but that's what we did with leadership, is created those nine, those nine proposals, those nine resolves at the end. These are the scoreboard for how to really make a difference and really change things. So I, I got going on that. I don't even know if I answered the well, question. Well, you did. Bastiat's law is like you look at it this way. You can, in, in life, you can either produce to survive or you can plunder others production to survive and if you start rewarding the plundering of other people's production then believe me a whole bunch of people will move that way because of Bastiat's law and say well hey I want to plunder someone's production too and you start out five percent of the people are plundering ninety five percent of the people then if it grows to ten percent of the people are plundering ninety percent well it doesn't work when sixty percent of the people are plundering forty percent eventually the odds the numbers don't work anymore and society collapses and you can look you can go back in history with the lens of the five laws of decline I'm gonna say something absolutely crazy here but I'm telling you historically that you can look at any society you can look at any company that failed you can look at any community that failed and when they failed you will see the five laws of decline when you it's like putting on a set of glasses and all of a sudden what you couldn't see before is so crystal clear. And when I finally put together the five laws of decline and started reading history with this lens, I was so blown away that I said, I've got to track down Oliver. I've got to share with him what I'm discovering because I don't know. And I can remember that our first, you know, you're like, all right, share your proposal. And before we even got into the actual proposal, we kind of talked through the five laws. And I can remember the moment, Oliver, I can remember him straightening up and say, okay, now explain that again. All right, I, and then I said, you know what, I think, and, and, and Oliver, because of his background historically of understanding the Constitution, understanding what the founders' intentions were, understanding why they were checking the government, because whether the founders knew the five laws declined, they understood human nature. They understood that people would prefer a handout over a hand up. They understood they would prefer plunder over production, or at least a majority of people would, and so they were putting checks and balances in place. So Oliver, can you take, can you go in that direction and explain just um, quickly the, uh, what was the founders' intentions? What, what did they see the role of government? And then how did the five laws decline, Bastiat's law being the pivot point, of course, yeah. how did the five laws decline start to seep into their work and literally expand it to where it's now be moving into a forced direction? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, they didn't, as you said, they didn't call it the five laws of decline, but the understanding of these principles are clear in their work. It's clearly there. And as you said, go back through history and look, I mean, go to Durant's, you know, 11-volume uh, history of the world. Go to any civilization. Go to the Greeks. Go to the, go to the Romans. Go, I mean, all the way through, including the Eastern cultures, and you're going to find these five laws at place in a declining society. And in a rising society, you're going to find leaders and the nation specifically addressing these five laws, again, not by name, but addressing these principles head on. Really powerful. The, I think Jefferson, in terms of the founders, Jefferson probably said it best when he said, and this gets to another one of the five laws, I'm going out of order here, but one of the, one of the laws is the law of diminishing returns, mm -hmm. which goes so well, well, it's an economic law, but when you apply it to a government, it's it, incredible the impact it has, the law of diminishing return says, uh, in, as applied to government, basically says as the government gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's going to do less and less and less for each citizen. It's going to accomplish less of what it's supposed to for the individuals in this, and, and, and specific communities. Because it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and so it becomes less and less efficient. 
less and less effective in what it's supposed to accomplish. Now, link those two together. Bosniets law, people would rather take the easy road than the hard road. And the law of diminishing returns, as the government gets bigger, it gets less effective, it gets less efficient. Put those together and what you've got is our modern, you've got our modern society. I mean, lock, stock, and barrel, you just got what we're living under. Because our government gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Why? Because entitlements grow and grow and grow. People want more and more and more the easy way. Voters want more and more ease. I don't, I don't want to get involved and stop it. And politicians want easy votes, so they, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And as the government gets bigger and bigger and bigger, because of the law of diminishing returns, it gets less and less effective, less and less efficient, and it's easier for corruption to enter in. It's easier for all the wrong agendas to keep winning because now they're even more difficult to stop by the, by the voters who see what's happening. And so these things combine together. Jefferson, without calling it the law of diminishing returns or Bosniet's law, said that the key, to gov the, the key to free government, the key to freedom, is to divide and subdivide government. Government, he said, and, and, and I'm switching back and forth between, between Jefferson's words and Madison's words, but lump their argument together, and basically what they said was, if men were angels, there would be no need of government. Men aren't angels. So you're going to have foreign attack. You're going to have local crime. You're going to have people who... Who, because crime is simply the easy way of taking from somebody something they already have that usually they gain the hard way. It's just another another type of plunder, as Oren said. So men aren't angels, and because of that, people are going to try to take the easy road and take from the people who work hard to earn what they get. There's going to be people who try to take it through crime, through government, through you know whatever it is. And so Jefferson said, government is necessary to stop crime, to stop invasion, but. The only way to remain safe, the only way for government itself not to become the biggest entity that's trying to take things the easy way, the only way to stop that is to divide and subdivide government. And so they, they separated the powers at the federal level. They checked and balanced those powers. They separated the levels of government. So you had local government, you had state governments with their own constitutions and their own sovereignty, their own, their own power to make final decisions. And then you have the federal government, and again, all of these were, were checked and balanced between each other and between levels. The whole point of that was to keep Bostiat's law and the law of diminishing returns from working together to create bigger and bigger government that took more and more from those who worked for it and gave less and less in terms of the real benefits to everyone else. I mean, that was the whole founding principle, and you can understand the whole founding viewpoint really from the standpoint of just those two laws of decline. They really created the Constitution, not just at the federal level, but the, but the local constitutions, the state constitutions that were written beforehand. And the, the local constitutions, for example, we have, uh, you know, we have uh, on record uh, hundreds of these state constitutions and these town constitutions, sorry, hundreds of state and town constitutions together. The town constitutions are really fascinating and we wrote this into our nine proposals for fixing the country, is that the town constitutions were all built around the same theme. Some of them written in, uh, you know, some of them written in Georgia, some of them written in, in Massachusetts, and everything in between, all up and down the, the coasts, coast, all up and down the, the coast in the 13 colonies, you had these towns. But an interesting thing, whether it was in Virginia or Massachusetts, which came from very different histories, the Jamestown history and the Pilgrim history they were there for different reasons. Jamestown was founded for monetary reasons. They were trying to make a profit. They were trying to create a business. The pilgrims were escaping and trying to get religious freedom. Um, so the and same with the Puritans who came who came to the same place. So you have. I mean, it, it's interesting though that these people who created these these societies for different things and the Carolinas for yet another another purpose. It was still it, it was it was a. Uh, it was a business purpose, but it was a totally different company. And yet, these, all these towns, hundreds of them, up and down the coast, set up their towns, and, and their constitutions are almost identical. Mm. They're almost the same. What they did is they had a one night a week where all the citizens from the town would come together, hear all the major challenges, and, and vote on what the solutions were. They did this all up and down, and it wasn't just here that it was done. 
Um, you know, Orrin and I were just talking a couple of days ago about how Gandhi, when he was trying to reform uh, India, did the same thing in India, built on these local get-togethers of all the adults coming together and making these decisions. The founders knew that in order to have freedom, you had to divide and subdivide government. And so they did it with separations of power, they did it with checks and balances, they wrote a constitution to do it at the federal level, and before that they had written all these, le all these constitutions to do it at the town levels. Now fast forward to today, we still have the federal constitution, we still have state constitutions, but there are almost no towns, I don't know of any, in North America where the decisions are made by the adults coming, all the adults in the town coming together, talking about their, their small town issues, or small community, it doesn't have to be, you know, in a, say in a city like Cincinnati or Columbus, you have a, sm a lot of smaller towns in order for, you know, a group of adults to get together to make these decisions. I mean, if people have watched the movies, the mo or the television show, Little House on the Prairie, they saw how that happened all the time. It's all through our history, and it shows up, you know, in a lot, in our literature, it shows up in our television programming of that era, where the towns would just, the, the town leaders and the adults in the town would come together, they would talk about challenges, they would uh, discuss possible solutions, they would vote, and then they would assign people to go implement these solutions. As long as we don't have local citizens involved on, on that kind of a level where they really have a vote today, local citizens, it's again, Boston, it's, like, it's just easier for them to stay out of it. But you give them a vote, you give them a say, and all of a sudden, a lot of them are more interested in being involved. The founders didn't write any of that into the Constitution, that local stuff, because it was just the way it was. It was like a fish in water. They saw no need to, to put water into the Constitution because it, it, they were, you know, it was just the experience they lived under. But over time, through the, through the 19th and the 20th century, as we lost those local things, the Constitution, which was designed to work with those local structures, when the local structures disappeared, the Constitution, you know, at the, at the national level, they just began to either ignore or, or, start, uh, or start breaking uh, parts of the Constitution, and there were no local citizen bodies with votes and say and power to stand up and do anything about it. So the whole th thing was really strongly built on a founding ideal. Well, that's amazing. You know, when you start thinking about the grassroots power of how the country was built, if you look at the, our, our profession, Orrin, you know, $150 billion in sales, it was built on the same concept, grassroots. So, you know, the, uh, the Thursday night meetings uh, where you could vote and people came together, isn't that kind of like a, a hotel opportunity meeting? You know, and I think I know one company that maybe you and I both know that at one time was a certain way, but if you look at the five, you know, everything you're talking about, it happened to them as they became a big bureaucracy. I think we've seen, you can look at that, and as I see it through those lens, as I look at it from what, as I've been learning from you, and as I've been understanding what you and Oliver have been teaching, I look at that as a whole different experience, you know, and, but you start to think about all of this, it's, uh, it now, for those that are watching us now, now you're starting, I think, to understand why what I said in the very beginning of the show, why this very well meet may be the most important leadership factory hangout we've done because it has everything to do with what? Our freedom. Okay, and at the end of the day, if one thing that I've learned in being an entrepreneur for 30 years is that you can't mess with our freedom. I mean, let's face it. I mean, that's what makes direct selling, that's what makes network marketing so powerful is that any ordinary person has a level playing field and if they want to be extraordinary, like an Orrin Woodward in 1994 decided he wanted to be free, right? We know what happened. We know the rest of the story. It's being written now because he decided, but he was ordinary, but wanted to become extraordinary. That's the gift that we have that we were born with, but we can lose it as easily as we have it, and we're losing it day by day. I see it. I think any business leader sees it, and I don't mean to become overly melodramatic, but for those of you that watch us, please hear what we're saying. This is important. This is really important for our future, for our family, our children, our grandchildren to understand this. There's, there's nothing more important. I mean, I know this is a show and it's about leadership, but I know that it's, it, it, it revolves around the direct selling profession and all of the wonderful things that we talk about. And we could be sitting here talking about, you know, how to build a system or how to do an opportunity meeting or how to train somebody. But without this, we got nothing. We got hey, nothing Tony. at all. Anyway, let, me, so, let me elaborate on that because that's the whole point of leadership. In other words, I feel like our whole profession is a whole bunch of people who are teaching them 
how to be entrepreneurs. We're teaching them how to make decisions and have freedom and grow and become big fish, so to speak, in their companies. Well, what's the point of becoming a big fish if all the water gets poisoned and all the fish die? In other words, we've got a responsibility, all of us as entrepreneurs, as leaders and leadership, we have a responsibility to protect the water for everybody, not just our company, not just even our profession, but for the whole country, for society at large. This is that significant. The five laws of decline were originally applied to leadership culture. The five laws of decline work within a company and destroy the culture of performance. People would love to have political results where, hey, I've been here so long and I'm so-and-so's bud, so I get a special deal. Well, you create a special deals culture, I promise you that company's going down. You create a special deals country, I promise you that, that country's going down because another country will still be on a performance-based culture and they will kick our butt. America and Western society is getting its butt kicked because we're playing, we're trying to have a special deals culture and the rest of the world's still playing on a performance-based culture. And so we've got to wake up and we've got to clean up the water so that the fish can grow based upon performance. And that kind of leads me, Oliver, into the next question. Before You know, I don't want a show where we try to depress everybody and tell all the problems. Now, I promise you, before we get off this show, we're going to talk about specific proposals, specific ways that leaders can step up in their communities, leaders can step up in their states, and ultimately in society at large and create a leadership so that we can restore the greatness of Western civilization because it is that big a deal. Uh, but before we get to the solution, let's go back one more step, Oliver. And you wrote a book called 1913. I don't know if you want to start there, but that book was phenomenal in describing three major things that happened in 1913. But, but what I don't think you did in that book is describe how 1913 and the five laws marry together. So if you want to kind of share what yeah. happened in 1913, and how is does that wrap in with the five laws of decline and has created this slide that we see going on? Love that. I, I don't want to spend uh, the rest of our time on, on all the details. I'll hit them fast. So uh, three things happened in 1913 that really changed the whole culture. One was the 16th Amendment, one was the 17th Amendment, and one was the, um, the passing of the Federal Reserve. The 16th Amendment basically said, it was the Income Tax Amendment, which basically said it changed something that the founders had believed in, which that was that all tax money should be collected at the local and state levels. And so they didn't allow the federal government to collect any taxes because they said the, the, states, can send, the states can send tax money to the federal government, and that's how the federal government will operate, on money that comes from the state governments. But they didn't want federal officials to be the ones who were sitting down looking you know looking at the citizens directly they always wanted to keep uh, a check a balance a, a, a separation between citizens and and federal officials they had seen how bad it could be under the British structure and they didn't want to go to that place where the national government was collecting the taxes and so with this with the 16th amendment we ruined that and went to you know the the, the government can you know now tax everybody the Seventeenth Amendment changed the way that the the senators were elected. They used to be elected by the state, the state uh, legislature, so that when they went back to Washington, the states oversaw everything that happened through the Senate. The Senate could basically it had a check or a balance on everything that went on in Washington. So Washington couldn't do anything without the state's permission. And the Seventeenth Amendment changed that. And then, of course, the Federal Reserve allowed us to print money, inflate the money print fiat money that, that can inflate and become worthless, which is a way that government makes money because it prints it and then spends it at today's values. And, and, and most of the business people listening already understand this. It's, uh, but then it inflates the money so that everybody else has to, has to spend their money at tomorrow or next week's values, which are worthless. Hmm. And those three changes really restructured the whole thing. Oren's point was, how did the American people allow that to happen? How, why, did we, why did we allow the 16th Amendment, the 17th Amendment, the Federalism, why did we allow that to, to come into, to, to, you know, to happen? And the answer is that the people by that time we had just basically, they would become so focused on their own lives, their careers, their, you know, the westward expansion, 
um, doing the things in their in in their personal life, their families, their work, that they sat back and they allowed this to occur, and that actually leads to one of the another one of the five laws of decline, which is Sturgeon's law, which mm -hmm. says that ten percent or less of the people are going to make most of the difference in society. Another way to say that is ninety percent of the people aren't going to do much of anything. Ninety percent of the people, or more, are just going to... Today, it's a lot more than ninety percent. Well, we've seen that back. before. Yeah. <laughs> and and this is this is real. I mean, you certainly see that in business. You see that in leadership. I mean, that's one of the things that leaders do is 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 try to, you know, try to... Hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. Tony, are you saying that people would sign up in their own business, actually pay money, to get into a business and then do nothing, like 90% of them? you got to be kidding me. Uh, or I think I've even seen people take business kits and put them on their wall as art. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like anybody, Sad, true. anybody who's been involved in network marketing understands Sturgeon's Law is alive and well. Oh, yeah. And oh, apply, yeah. This, apply this to, to government. Are you telling me that people with freedom – Freedom to do what they want. They don't have the state military coming into their house and telling them how many kids they can have yet. They don't have, I mean, we could just go through this long list of things. Your kid's this age and he tested this way and this, so he has to go to this school and he has to take these classes and we have to put him in, in this training. I mean, we, we have so many freedoms as families, as, as you know, marriage is still is still sacred to a large segment of the American people. Um, but freedom, you take away freedom and those things are on the table. Those things all of a sudden, the government's telling you what you have to do with your life and your kids what they have to do with their life. And, you know, you literally live in fear in the night and, the, and someone knocks on the door at, at night. I mean, this is the majority of people in the world today. So they hear a knock on the door at night and they are terrorized because they don't know if they'll ever see their father again. I mean, are you telling me people would have something as precious as freedom and use it as art? We, we put up pictures of the founders or the flag, we fly, but then when it comes time to actually make a difference, we take Bastia, we take the easy way, we don't do something. So that's what leadership is about. I, I mean, that's what leadership, that's what this book is about, is the idea that we need a shift in leadership. Because if we believe that Washington is going to suddenly, miraculously, start doing it differently than it's done for the last 40 years, especially for the last 15 years. If we believe that Washington is all of a sudden, miraculously, just going to fix our problems and we're not going to keep going in the direction we are, we're fooling ourselves. We're lying to ourselves. Washington is not going to fix America's problems. If America's problems are going to be fixed, it's going to be by less than 10%. I mean, I, I wish. Orrin and I wish it could be 10%. Wow, I think we'd be thrilled if we could get 3%. If we could get 3% of the population who cares about freedom, who loves freedom, who understand, to just stand up and make their influence felt, especially, especially business leaders. Give us, give us 3% of the top business leaders, the, uh, the top entrepreneurial business thinking, network marketing, executive, whatever their business focus. Give us the top 3% who will spend a few hours a week giving their heart and soul to making a difference on freedom the way that they have in, in other parts of leadership, and we will see this country sh change. We will see a shift in leadership. And until we see that kind of shift in leadership, we're going to see crisis after crisis after crisis out of Washington, and they're going to use every crisis to regulate more, tax more, and decrease our freedoms. That's what leadership is all about. Um, 1913 and those things that happened, as well as the things that are happening today, are happening precisely because you've got a, 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 almost half the population who just wants the easy road, government help us, and another half of the population who really could make a difference, who understand and love freedom, who could make it, who are content to sit back and just let it happen. So Sturgeon's Law, we don't need, we don't even need 10 percent, we don't need 50 percent. We need maybe 3%. I, I, boy, if we could get, think of this. If we could get 1% of the best business leaders in our society mm -hmm. to get serious about freedom, 
to get serious about promoting freedom, about standing for freedom, about getting out there and, and promoting, under, help everybody understand those five laws of decline, and then help people start applying these nine proposals we've had, or reject our nine proposals, any proposals that are at the same level, the same kind of thinking. If you don't like ours, come up with your own. Like the founders, moving forward, innovating to fix our society. If we could get 1% of our business leaders in this country to take that seriously and to give their leadership wisdom, their potential, their resources, their contacts, to go out and start making an influence, not through some group, but just them leading and doing it, we would see a turnaround. And until we see that kind of shift in leadership, we're going to see more and more from Washington. Mm -hmm. And because of the law of momentum, it's going to get worse and worse and worse because it's speeding up. We've got what we're getting from Washington today is worse than what we were getting six years ago, and it's and it's, and that was worse than what we got six years before that, and and we're talking in terms technically of the amount of spending. You know the Bush administration tripled the amount of spending over the Clinton administration, and then the Obama administration came in and tripled the amount of government spending over the Bush administration just in the first term. Hey Oliver, that reminds me of that old joke. You know, say. Like, um uh, how'd you go broke? Well, slowly at first and then really fast at the end. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly where we are. There will come a time if current trends continue and, and the leadership doesn't occur. There will come a time where we'll have to step up. But by then, the problem will be so bad that we'll be stepping up in, in, in just in, in maintaining any kind of, I mean, it'll be survival if we keep going in this direction. Yeah, it, you know, Oliver, I know we're running out of time, and I want to make sure we sum this up on a positive perspective, but Absolutely. You're, what, you're, what you're hitting is so true. It's like, if we do not, like, we are not at the point where we can afford, it's like the, it's, um, the sunshine patriots. Like, we've got to wake yeah. up and recognize that we are in critical times for leaders. We've got a warfare and welfare state. This is not a Democrat or a Republican, because Either one, the warfare state would bankrupt a company. The welfare state would bankrupt a company. But when you try to combine both of them, the warfare and welfare state, what you get is a country that started in 1789, uh, <clears throat> 1787, sorry, and you take 200 years go by, by 1987, we were somewhere around a, a trillion dollar national debt. Today, we have increases of over a trillion dollars every year. That is truly the slow at first, very fast at the end. This yeah. is this is not something. You can turn off your computer. You can just ignore anything I said, but this is not something. This is Jeremiah speaking, saying this cannot stand. We must address this. We need leaders. Every single household, every person watching this has to recognize that you are responsible to balance your budget. If you do not balance your budget over time, Banks come knocking on your door, they take your car. Banks come knocking on your door, tell you you can leave the house now. It's not yours anymore. And uh, you have to address that. You reap what you sow. It is absolutely insane to me that every single person in America has held the responsibility to balance their own budget, yet we elect, quote, the best and brightest and put them into a government position where they're not responsible to even do something as simple as balance their budget. So we've got to get that core frame and say that no, political leadership has to go together and from now on you are going to be held to your budget and you're going to have to tell the people no, despite they want the five laws of crime, you're going to have to tell them no. In fact, we're going to help you tell them no because we are going to limit the amount of money you're going to get because there's no such thing as limited government until you limit the funds the government has access to because money and power always go together. We're going to limit the funds. Let's start at 10%. You can say, we'll never survive on 10%. Well, that's what every stinking person will say. Everybody says, no, I need a million to live on. I need 100,000 to live on. Everybody wants more than they're making. That's why we have the national endemic of debt that we have today in individuals, uh, lo localities, state, and federal. But we just draw the line and say, your government can defend us internally and externally for 10%. Localities that Oliver, you did such a great job of describing that. Let's give the localities four percent and push as much government down to the local level as possible. Let's give the states three percent and push as much government away from the federal to the state 
to the localities as possible and then give the federal 3% of all the money. That means 10% total. Just that alone is going to stimulate the economy like crazy because people will have more of their money. And government has never created a job in its life. By definition, the government has to take from somebody to give to somebody else. It's like we got to get rid of this Robin Hood model of government and start having people that are entrepreneurs have money so they can go out and stimulate the economy by hiring people as entrepreneurs and creating businesses that help our society compete against other societies. Now imagine this model, 10%, 4% for the local, 3% for the state, 3% for the federal. If I'm a federal head, if I'm quote the president of the country and I say, man, I've got this great idea for a war. I want to go to Iraq. I want to have some fun over there. I want to send millions of people and spend billions of dollars. But um, because I got to balance my budget, I don't have the money to do that. And I can't print money anymore because we don't allow just to print money. I can't play monopoly money. So I got to go to Oliver and Tony, who are both governors of states. And I got to go to all 50 states, stand before them without blushing and say that I want to take your budget, I need you to give me half of your 3% so I can have enough money to go uh, uh, play war over in Iraq or any other country. Now, Tony, Oliver, are you really going to reach into your, this will be the first time in history a politician has to reach into his own pockets to hand over money to somebody. Are you honestly telling me, now, you're not worried about Iraq coming over and invading America, I don't think, and it, unless there's some threat to your state, why would you let me, as the protector internally and externally for you, why would you let me take half of your budget? You know See, what you'd that's, say? That's the, I just, that's the brilliant thing about it, because if I really am in danger, if the nation really is in danger from attack, then Tony and I are both going to vote yes. That's that's the colonial America. The colonial America did unite together. They yeah. did work together when there was a common enemy. But if there's not a common enemy, we ensure that the five laws of decline work against one another. The state five laws of decline works against the federal five laws of decline, which works against the locality. So now we have government checking government. You and I are not big enough. Tony, you and I are not big enough to go to Washington and say, we need you to reduce our taxes. They're going to laugh at us. But when you have the state saying, no, we're not going to give you anymore, the federal government, the states are big enough that they can withstand and tell the federal government no. And now we've got the federal government cannot reach down to the local citizen. It has to work through the different units of government. And we have government checking government. And what happens is freedom is in the gaps. Freedom is in the gaps. By having the governments check one another, the people enjoy freedom because the governments battle with one another to make sure that neither one of them gets too strong to steal freedom from its citizens. Mm. That is a leadership. Is it going to be tough? It's going to be the toughest thing we've ever done in our life. But it's also the most necessary if we care about the posterity of America and Western civilization. And it's not going to be nearly as tough as if we just let it continue and gain momentum and go where it's headed right now. And, and another thing in that that's so powerful, I mean, Oren just outlined one of our nine proposals. There's nine in there. That's one of them where you really, you really create teeth where the, where the federal government has a limited budget. I mean, we're not even asking for a balanced budget amendment. We're writing in a proposal that, that only gives them so much money, and then they can decide how to spend it. And that's what, and that's one of those tough proposals that we put in there. This leadership is so real; it can happen. It must happen. If it doesn't happen, then we're going to keep getting the kind of leadership we've had, and we're going to get worse and worse results because that's the direction that we're headed in. L let me just say one thing to look at uh, the leadership from a business perspective. Back in the '60s and '70s, actually, it was even earlier because you had Edward Demings back in the '30s and '40s who talked about the management revolution. See, before that, business had mostly been run by professionals who set up, like, you know, a professional law firm or a professional medical firm or, or a professional accounting firm. And society was run by a professional and maybe a, a partnership of several professionals, and then they hired people who worked for them. And Demings came along and argued about this, Edward Deming, this, art, this idea of, we can go to professional management. And so you had the management revolution mm -hmm. where we brought, it, brought in professional managers. And then fast forward 40 years, we had the leadership revolution. 
where people like uh, Buckminster Fuller and you know Stephen Covey and others said, "Hey, what we need is we need a leadership revolution. Management's fine, but management is doing things right. We need leadership where you do the right things. Let's let's have." And so they led a leadership revolution that really it did revolutionize business, just as the management revolution had changed from just professional firms were the main thing in business to this new model where you had managers and boards and executives and managers of different departments and then that got revolutionized by the leadership movement which said let's do leadership let's take leadership far and wide today we are facing another revolution the leadership revolution another another leadership where we say listen you can continue to make your business successful as a leader but if you're making your business successful and the government is regulating it out of existence and regulating freedom and prosperity away then you can keep you can keep i mean it's the old it's the old cliche of rearranging deck chairs on the titanic <laughs> you can be the best leader of the of the titanic um, the, the titanic chair arrangement platoon you can be so good at it you can be you can be fortune 100 you can be the best at it. If the si if the ship sinks, you didn't accomplish much. Amen. And so what what we've got right now is we've seen a management revolution, we've seen a leadership revolution. We are in desperate need right now of a leadership revolution, which says, "Yeah, I'm going to lead my business. I'm going to continue to make it profitable and successful and make a difference through business." We need a bunch of business leaders who also say, and at the same time. I'm going to use my business experience and wisdom and skill and understanding, and I'm going to help lead this nation. Because, mm -hmm. again, we desperately need a leadership. If we don't shift who the leaders are, if business leaders, regular business leaders, don't take their leadership abilities and apply them to what's happening to our freedoms, the Titanic's sinking, and pretty soon it won't matter how good you are in your business. You know, Tony, why don't you wrap this up and just kind of share from your perspective how the Home Business Radio Network listeners can help. I appreciate that. You know, and that's exactly what I was thinking as we were moving forward was um, a few action steps, Oren. You know, just, um, you know, what we've, in network marketing and direct sales, for those who are listening to us, you understand, most of you understand the difference between management mode and building mode. I mean, that's what's common. In every company, we talk about that in leadership. And the way the government has become, in my mind, is a total, it's, a, it's in management mode, totally, you know. Mm. And it's, it's only going to fall apart in, unless we do something about it. And uh, like you said, from the 1913, what happened at that point, those handful of things that happened, how they changed society moving forward, we can't today, in 2013, Oliver and Orrin, we can't today do the same thing that they did back then, which is to stick our fat heads in the sand and go, you know, well, you know what, my latest iPhone 5, it doesn't matter. You know, in other words, we've got to get out of our own narcissistic self and for a moment and realize even back in World War II, people were more, and I don't mean to get on a rant on this, but people were more in the freedom and more in the, you know, really getting behind, you know, protecting our freedoms. And, and today we've become more apathetic. You know, apathy is a major issue we have. We've got to wake up and realize that the latest gadget, the latest app, the latest reality show, boo-boo, whatever, I don't know, whatever is out there, doesn't mean anything. You know, without our freedom, building a network doesn't mean anything without our freedom. So, the point is, is what some of the things I think we can do is it's all in the grassroots. One of the challenges that people have is that they don't think that one person can make a difference. It's not one plus one equals two. It's one plus one is eleven. There's a big difference. It's like the synergy between you, Oliver, and Oren. You guys exponentially have grown in ideas. Just look at the difference you're making. So, what somebody can do with a handful, a quorum, a small group. Uh, you know, quorum, I, I believe it stands for a small group of people with power. A small group of people with power in any state, in any company, in any entrepreneurial part of society can make a difference, right? And no matter what company you're in, here's one of the first action steps I'd have. Go to Oren Woodward's blog. He does a very good job, and you do, Oliver, I know you put a lot of input in, and help Oren as well, but there's a lot of great information that updates constantly. You need to go to that blog. You need to understand the five laws of decline. You need to get the book. I mean, leadership is an important book. I mean, it's not that expensive. You can't. You can afford to go a couple of days without a latte, okay? Come on. Get the book. The books that you don't read won't help you. We know that. 
and then from there start talking with people start sharing some of these ideas look at look for the 10 percenters in your companies look for the leaders who are the, who are they they're the ones doing meetings they're the ones on the calls they're the ones going to the regionals they're the ones at the area events Go to them and share these concepts with them. They'll pick it up. They'll want to do something about it. And if we do these things, we have the ability to not only have a leadership, because if we don't have a leadership, we're going to have a freedom shift. And it's going to be freedom gone. And, that, and that's just my opinion on it. I, I, you know, like I said, we're, we're a very positive, happy family here and a big positive, happy show. But I don't know. I want multi-generations of residual income. And without the, the Titanic being there, like you said, it's a perfect example. The Titanic goes down. The chairs are gone. Nothing we do is going to matter anyway. So at this point, let's do what we can. Let's start moving forward. And with that, I want to thank all of you. Oliver, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your valuable time and your wisdom you're um, you're a walking talking encyclopedia for freedom and you are absolutely a person and that you know it's funny when things come in life you know it's like you stand the people that have it stand up and you're, you're standing up and I I commend you for that or and obviously that's all you've ever been I mean you you constantly are fighting you're constantly fighting for the dream and freedom and people to have a better quality of life and everything that you do you stand for is greatness it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to co-host this show for you and once again, everybody, this is a, another phenomenal Google Factory Hangout. This is Tony Kalu, the host of the uh, Google, co-host of the Google Factory Hangout Leadership Factory. Have a great week, great month, and please take action today. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week, and uh, God bless.